So um, thank you all so much for joining us again this evening. Um, we are about to go into our speaker series portion of the evening. And tonight uh, we have got two Oshawa Museum staff who will be delivering the talk this evening. Uh, it's going to be Melissa Cole, our curator, and Mia Vujic. Mia has been associated with the museum for quite a few years now. She has been with us I believe every summer since 2017, correct me if I'm wrong, Mia, please on those dates. And Mia throughout her time here has been working very hard on, at the time, what we were calling our Displaced Persons Project, and now has morphed into our 2021 feature exhibition, Leaving Home, Finding Home in Oshawa. Uh, Mia has corrected me, it was 2018. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> um, uh, so this feature exhibition should hopefully be open sometime this summer. And to give you all a little flavor about some of the stories that will be told in this exhibit, I will now um, turn it over to Melissa and Mia and give them a warm welcome for this evening. And Lisa, is my screen sharing okay? Yes, your screen is sharing fine. Thank you very much. So thank you, Lisa, for that warm welcome. And thank you everyone for joining us on this lovely spring evening uh, at our AGM and uh, our monthly meeting. So museums are often thought of as places that collect, care for, display, and interpret objects. While valid in many ways, this view omits the human element of museums. An alternative approach is to think of museums as places that collate and share human experiences. In our daily work, we must go beyond the walls of our buildings and establish lines of dialogue with our communities, deepening our relationships with them and generating authentic bonds as we serve you, our visitors and audience. Tonight, Mia and I will share a project about collecting the memories of those who have arrived in Oshawa as displaced persons. After the Second World War, Mia has been involved with the project shortly after its inception as a young Canada Works student. She has assisted in the development of an online exhibit, collecting stories from the community through oral history interviews, and assisting with the development and creation of our latest exhibition, Leaving Home and Finding Home in Oshawa. I will first provide you with a bit of background about our project, and Mia will share a few stories and talk about the exhibit that will open this summer. Just so you know as well, we are hoping to open this exhibit last summer or last spring, but due to COVID and the amount of individuals that were involved in this project, we thought it would be best to keep it and open it for this year. And we do thank everyone for their patience in, the, in our delay in opening it. I spoke with our archivist, Jennifer Waymark, about how the project started. It came about in late 2015, early, in early 2016. As I watched Canada launch Operation Syrian Refugees, arriving here were people whose country had been ravaged by war, people who had lost everything and were coming to Canada in search of a safe place to start over. Hearing these stories, it reminded me of stories I knew about many Oshawa residents who arrived here as displaced persons after World War II, who had left their country ravaged and them without a home. After World War II, Canada was a place to start over for many who lost everything during the war. Oshawa itself had become, a home to, had become home to a large number of displaced persons from all across Eastern Europe. Their stories, their experiences helped shape the Oshawa we live in today. We felt it was important to learn more about their experiences and to see if they were different from the experiences of a group of people coming to Canada in search of safety and a new life. The museum started another memory book project to collect the stories of individuals who arrived in Oshawa as DPs. The museum reached out to various community partners and organizations in Oshawa to assist us in distributing information about the project to their members, Sorry for one minute. I have a cat that is playing with a toy beside me. So just one moment, please. I apologize about that. 
So the museum reached out to various community partners and organizations in Oshawa to assist us in distributing information about the project to their members. Museum staff provided information sessions and were invited to attend local events. These stories have become part of the Oshawa Archival Collection and will be used by future generations of researchers. It is these stories that fill our latest exhibit with the voices of whose experience we are exhibiting. After the Second World War, the term displaced persons referred to individuals who had become displaced due to conflict. Over 157,000 displaced people came to Canada, marking one of the most significant periods of immigration in the country's history. The aftermath of World War II saw a world faced with the mass movement of human beings on a scale never before seen. Initially, the idea was to repatriate people back to the countries from where they had been displaced. It soon became clear that this was not going to be possible. When the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration concluded its work, there were still well over 1.1 million displaced persons who were, who were determined to be non-repatriable. The, the job of finding homes for these individuals and families was handed over to the newly created International Refugee Organization. Their task was to find homes for approximately 875,000 people. This incredible image really speaks to our exhibit, and it shows Hildegard Suchin and, and uh, De Detlef Suchin. This is our executive director's uh, father and his mother. And they had arrived in Halifax in March 1952 on the ship Neputania. In 1947, the Canadian government agreed to open the borders for 5,000 displaced persons to come to Canada and begin life anew. The ads seen here are from the Times-Gazette newspaper in Oshawa, ranging in dates from 1946 to 1948. Oshawa became an enticing place for relocation for many Ukrainians escaping Europe after World War II, due in large part to the large Ukrainian community in the city. Immigration to Oshawa by Ukrainians began around 1907 when a gentleman by the name of Julian Kalinko moved here. His arrival was the start of a growing community of Ukrainian immigrants to the southern end of the city. At this time, the southern border of the, southern border of the city would have been Bloor Street. The area south of Bloor Street and Simcoe Street South was known as Cedardale, not annexed with the city of with the town of Oshawa until 1924. In 1946, the Oshawa branch of the Canadian Ukrainian Committee spoke to the community about several resolutions put forth by the committee to bring Ukrainian DPs to Canada. Upon arriving in Oshawa, Ukrainians found themselves in an area that felt much like home. There were several Ukrainian churches, community halls such as Ukrainian National Hall, and a small real retail sector of businesses owned by Ukrainians. There were also readily available jobs in, in the many manufacturing industries, such as Fittings Limited, a company that manufactured pipe fittings, waterwork fittings, and plumbing brass goods. Similar to the Ukrainian community, there was already an established Polish community in Oshawa prior to the Second World War. The Polish community settled around the Olive Street area and established, business and, and established businesses and organization to serve members of their community. Work was available at numerous industri industries that were operating in Oshawa, such as the Ontario Malibu Works. The works was located close to the neighborhood around Olive Avenue. And just getting a glimpse here at this 1948 fire insurance map, um, you can sort of, um, you can see where the large uh, factory of Ontario Malleable is, and then in other areas you can see where the Olive Street row houses are at the top, where you can see all the connected buildings, and you can really see the development of smaller little neighborhoods and communities um, developing in this area. Lisa Terich um, recently shared a family story with me about her Polish heritage and related to her great-grandfather, John Terich, and his family when they settled in the Olive Street row houses. Stories from my grandpa and great-aunts tell of many happy years on Olive Avenue 
a neighborhood of Oshawa, which at the time was heavily settled by Eastern European settlers. The row houses were hot in the summer and some nights were spent by children sleeping across the road in, Cow in Cowan Park for the relief of the heat. You can actually see Cowan Park um, just, uh, just south of the Olive Street row houses on this fire insurance map. The size of the home, although still modest, would have been well used by the six children, a few of whom would have lived in the family home after getting married with their new spouses. While Ukrainian and Polish immigrants made up a large percentage of displaced persons to settle in Oshawa, immigrants were also arriving in Canada from many other countries, such as Italy, Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium. The final slide that I'm going to share before I pass over uh, the presentation to Mia is thanking our participants. We are grateful to everyone who participated in our project and who has trusted us to archive and share their stories. And this is a list of a few of the, the family um, that has participated um, and shared either their family story or their the story has been shared by themselves. And we thank everyone for sharing their story with us. I'm now like to introduce Mia who is gonna take you on the rest of the journey this evening. It's been a pleasure to work with Mia throughout the, the many years on this project um, and to really see the exhibit turn into um, what it um, will be once we get it set up. But um, Mia, I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you very much. Um, so over the summer of 2018, when I first became involved with the project, I worked on the online exhibit, Oshawa Post-World War II, Resettling Displaced People, a screenshot from which you can see now on the slide. This exhibit highlights archival documents, newspapers, and photographs, as well as quotes and stories from the oral history projects, memory books, and interviews. Uh, I organized these items into 12 entries, which fit the overarching exhibit themes of work and community life. Likewise, the sub-themes sought to draw attention to similarities across different immigration experiences, of which there were unsurprisingly very many. In other words, when deciding on what to write about, uh, the donated materials and oral histories uh, directly guided me. Supplementary historical research helped fill any contextual gaps. For example, expectations and first impressions highlights quotes expressing how displaced persons felt upon first arriving to Canada. A major trend was to comment on the sense of uncertainty balanced with a burgeoning sense of safety. Another frequent trend was to comment on the natural landscape or weather, which was often much colder than expected. For example, Bill Dransky, who immigrated from Poland, remarked the following. Uh, we were taken aback by the expansive wilderness of Canada. We had departed from a city and Northern Ontario was an eye opener. On the other hand, the entry across the Atlantic highlights materials such as family photographs or letters indicating who and what individuals had to leave behind in order to move to Canada. This sparks reflection on the journey of immigrating and what few items people were able to carry with them. Um, next slide, please. Uh, when designing the online exhibit, I drew inspiration from the very colorful identity and travel documents that the Oral History Project participants had donated to the museum's archives. Uh, so on the slide, uh, on the next slide, you can see um, two IDs which stood out for their vibrant use of the colors purple and green. Um, you can also see the, or you will be able to see in a moment, the header of a text panel for the physical exhibit, which takes inspiration from the same color scheme I used when discussing the topic on the online exhibit. Uh, in this sense, the content themes and even the very same colors all cross over from the online exhibit to the physical one in one way or another. So the first document you can see now is a temporary travel document in lieu of a passport for stateless persons and persons of undetermined nationality, which was used, which was used by Zania Kolecijek. Uh, so the document is trilingual with information written in English, French, and German. It also has information about the three allied armies which would have controlled the displaced person camps and had been stationed around Germany at the time. So that is the French, British and American armies. Uh, the other document, which you can see the top of here, is a citizenship document issued to Zania Kolodzicek as well. 
Uh, when discussing early memories of Oshawa, some of the project's participants commented on how they felt when first getting Canadian, citizen, uh, Canadian citizenship, including the Kaledzijaks in 1957. The document coincidentally also makes use of the vibrant purple and green colors in addition to red as well, uh, forming the beautiful border around the citizenship information, as you can see. So when comparing these two documents, uh, the circular nature of the story we were telling really uh, struck me. So that is when displaced persons were forced to leave with anonymous passports, quoting statelessness, um, they would eventually receive a more, much more personalized Canadian documents such as this one, which they could then remember uh, fondly when recalling their stories. The same notion of circularity eventually led to the name of the in-person exhibit as well, that is uh, the portion leaving home, finding home in Oshawa, and it served to inspire the layout and other design elements as well. So now I'll touch on a bit more of the background as well. So in the early 20th century, Canada's immigration policy was one of exclusion. After World War II, there was an overall sympathy toward displaced persons of war-torn Europe, however. With the base in Canadian Parliament and support from local and cultural community organizations, such as those in Oshawa, the doors to Canada did eventually open. Once arrangements had been made to immigrate and travel to Canada, the long and uncomfortable journey by ship began. The image you see on the slide is the passport depicting the Scythia, a Cunard Star Line ship. It traveled from Europe, from ports in Germany or Italy to Nova Scotia, where it docked at Halifax. Newly landed immigrants could go through customs and processing at Pier 21, uh, which is today the Canadian Museum of Immigration. This postcard was donated to the Oshawa Museum by Edward Kolodzijak. So despite the easing of immigration restrictions for some time immediately after World War II, the separation of parents from their children or spouses from one another often still occurred. In some cases, the reality of war made reunion impossible. However, often the most uncertain times uh, did eventually lead to happiness with family reunification in Canada. This would often take several years as a Canadian immigration policy did not facilitate families traveling together for many decades, even after the war had ended. Uh, in this sense, family members, including children, had quite varied experiences of the post-war immigration journey. Um, if they were too young to fully understand what was happening, as were a few participants in the oral history project. Uh, they may have actually enjoyed the novelty of, you know, running around the ship and playing with other kids their age, as uh, some participants have commented on. Um, requirements, requirements around immigration were strict at this time, favoring able-bodied young men willing to sign a labor contract with a particular company. Uh, the most frequent industries for such contracts were farming, mining, or forestry and the labor contracts often lasted two years. So on the next slide, we will see uh, Steve Malish, who was a Ukrainian displaced person, who worked, displaced person who worked at Brompton Pulp and Paper, a lumber company in Northern Ontario. Here you can see a photo of him at work, and you can also see his identification card indicating that he had arrived in the Port of Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1947 and began working in Beardmore, Ontario shortly after. Uh, if you look closely, the bottom of the card also notes what to do in case of serious accident, and the back of the ID similarly encourages the cardholder to preach and practice safety first and to be careful of fire. Uh, so as Melissa had mentioned earlier in her presentation, the key to this exhibit and the work the museum does is to share stories of people. So placing these two items in conversation with one another, uh, to me, indicates the importance of doing so of reading between the lines of text and trying to imagine the lives of the people impacted by, by it. So in this particular case, uh, it brings to light the danger of harsh working conditions and the sacrifices made by displaced persons uh, to make a life in Canada. Uh, additionally, while this card had, uh, quote, useful information, such as conversion rates and how to become a Canadian citizen, uh, Steve Malish and many other displaced persons did not speak English very well or at all uh, when they first came to Canada until they had a chance to learn uh, very quickly while on the job. So in that sense, uh, the information on these cards would not have been useful 
uh, for quite a while. Uh, similarly, many displaced persons who worked in other industries commented on the poor quality of life and their desire to move on to something safer as soon as possible, as dictated by the length of their labor contracts. Jan Kiosk, or Chiosk, for example, pointed out some of the differences between Oshawa and Kirkland Lake, where he had worked, saying he felt that it was like day and night. He explained that he finally felt safe after the destruction of Poland and Germany and working in the mine, in the mine when he was able to move to Oshawa. Due to this, he said that it had felt like the beginning of his life when he was able to make that move. Um, however, work in Oshawa was not always the safest either, unfortunately. Other than seasonally based industries such as construction and farming, it was usually much more stable at the very least. Uh, the jobs available for recent immigrants in Oshawa at this time included uh, the factories, uh, Fittings Limited, TJ Gale, Lumber & Co, uh, Hedale Industries, Malleable Ironworks, Peddler People, Robson, and Robson Leather. Uh, many displaced persons aspired to and eventually did work at General Motors as it was uh, said to have better conditions and better pay. However, um, that was only possible after having been in Canada for quite a few years. And for many of these positions, generally, it helped to have a friend or an acquaintance from one's community who was able to put in a good word. For example, the following quote describes how Steve Malish decided to move to Oshawa. Uh, it says, while working for the Brompton Pulp and Paper, many of us heard that there is a large Ukrainian community in Oshawa. A group of friends and I decided to come and see if we could find work and a place to live. So while the Polish and Ukrainian communities are perhaps the most well-known in Oshawa, uh, many others were also uh, renewed or bolstered by post-war immigration. These included the Italian, uh, German, Hungarian, Serbian, Slovenian, Maltese and Greek communities, as well as others. And although the landscape of Oshawa has changed a lot in the last 70 or so years, many active churches and community halls and clubs can still be found, some of which are still in their original locations. Uh, of course, in normal years, these are highlighted with the uh, annual uh, Fiesta Week Food Festival. Um, so on the next slide, we will see a few um, buildings, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and I'll also kind of discuss a bit more about the research project uh, or process for the exhibit. So I found that looking very closely at buildings in the neighborhoods that they found themselves in um, proved to be quite useful. So for instance, I had never realized that the Slovak community had had quite a large presence in Oshawa until one day while driving home from work, I noticed the Slovak church on Ritson Road taking note of its Byzantine inspired architecture and leading, later looking it up to see what I could find about it. Uh, after some research, it turned out that the Slovak community had been in Oshawa since at least the 1920s, as one Oshawa reformer article from 1968 indicated uh, that the community was celebrating its 40th anniversary. Uh, this article also mentioned three different community centers, um, a Slovak League branch, uh, Catholic Slovak Union branch, and a Slovak National Hall. Although these buildings are no longer around, the presence of the church was able to indicate that the community itself was worth looking into more. And I'm glad that um, we were able to find out more as we did. Similarly, one of my um, favorite moments of the research process was coming to an understanding of the connection between the different Ukrainian churches in Oshawa which had at one point numbered six in total and included two on the very same block. Uh, the intrigue or confusion did not stop there as all of the sources I had been consulting called one of the churches um, by a different name. So that's the church that you can see on the slide there. Uh, so the different names were Greek, Russian or Ukrainian Orthodox. Uh, as a, we later realized this was in part due to a translation issue. But the church in question is the church on Bloor Street East um, and also its entry in the 1926 Vernon Street Directory, which you can see. And together, looking at the images as well as um, just the church the way it stands today, as you can see on the right, um, 
was able to help us determine its history. So focusing on this one church provided a window into the past from which it was possible to see the interactions between other cultural communities in the city. The way that the church changed ownership um, from Ukrainian to Greek, to most re recently Romanian, uh, also was able to provide insight into immigration trends uh, in Oshawa as well, from the post-war period to more recently. And finally, um, on the last slide, you will see an image on Simcoe Street in the late or in the early 1940s, uh, just before the time many of the displaced persons would begin to make Oshawa their home. As Steve Malish's recollection described, everything he needed was within walking distance, and he could have uh, his pick of Ukrainian community centers uh, that he wanted to participate in. Uh, like many of the other staff at the museum, I also have personal connections to these topics and I've made discoveries about my own family history in the process of research. As such, one of my biggest takeaways from working on the project is how learning the history of the city where you are, where you are from or living in allows you to see its landscape in an entirely new light. Just as reading uh, between the lines of text or connecting photographs to stories helps bring to life the experiences of people who shared them. I hope that when you are able to visit the in-person exhibit, you feel some of that same sense of seeing Oshawa a little differently as it was in post-war decades and how that period shaped Oshawa that we live in today. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mia and Melissa. Um, I got a sneak peek of this talk last Friday when we were testing this out, and it was uh, just as excellent the day of. Uh, if you have questions for our panelists this evening, I'm going to encourage you to please use the Q&A function. Um, that way uh, we can see your questions and the panelists will be able to address it. To get things started, I will ask Melissa and Mia each, what is your favorite story that you were told throughout this process? Does one stick out for you? Um, I can start. For, for me, nah, I can't really choose just one. Um, I always enjoy, for, especially recently, because some of the staff has started coming forward, and I did share a couple of those stories today, and I think just working with the staff as well. So it was interesting to hear some of our, our my, like for me, some of the staff stories and hearing um, about their roots in our community as well. Uh, I would have to say maybe one of my favorite stories uh, that I heard shared um, was kind of just an everyday interaction uh, that used to occur at uh, the Oshawa Bakery, um, which was located close close to one of the um, Polish halls. And um, it was just kind of the, the way that the person was able to describe it. it. I was really kind of brought into the story and I could imagine kind of just stopping by and, you know, picking up the pastries and that kind of thing. But as Melissa said, it was really hard to choose. And another comment I, I wanted to make, I was talking to my colleagues earlier this week or last week about even driving in the area where, um, where the row houses are and particularly in that specific area and just seeing the landmarks that are in place today um, by the community who has helped uh, develop it and make it the, make it the city that we, that we are today. Wonderful. Thank you both for sharing that. I have got a question from the chat. Uh, did you learn much about the farm family immigration process? Uh, this question, I hope Carrie doesn't mind me naming her. Uh, that is how her family was able to come to Canada as a whole family. I myself have not, but Carrie and I have been talking and I'm hoping that I get to hear um, that story very soon. <laughs> Mia, did you come across anything in your research yourself? Uh, not too much, except that there were kind of parallel processes for um, uh, immigration and labor contracts into yes. agriculture or farming. And um, the only thing I can remember at the moment is that there was a lot of uh, Dutch immigration kind of like outside of the boundaries of Oshawa at this time. Um, so I'm not sure if that kind of relates to this particular instance or not, but yeah. 
And we have one other question in the chat. Uh, were there any special schooling arrangements for new arrivals? Mia, do you want me to answer that? We do know for a fact that um, there were Ukrainian schools or Polish schools that were actually set up right in, um, in their community churches or halls where um, students could meet and continue to learn their languages and, um, and such. And we do actually have photographs as well. Um, some that came to us from um, Mia's research actually when she went to the archives of Ontario, we have a few images uh, that might make an appearance in the exhibit as well. Yes, and also the other um, schooling also related to language, um, which is kind of like English language lessons. Um, although I'm not sure if it was as uh, kind of, um, if it was or well organized or more kind of ad hoc. Uh, yeah. And uh, from Merle again, um, I think this is more of a, a comment, but thank you so much for sharing. Uh, many Dutch immigrants were destined for Western farms, but decided to stay in Oshawa as they had no farming experience. Thank you for that anecdote. Thank you. And with that, I am not seeing any other questions. So once again, I will thank both Melissa and Mia for such an interesting topic, uh, for such an interesting talk this evening. And I'm going to encourage everyone, um, once we are open and once the exhibition is open and we're able to safely gather in spaces, please come down and visit the museum. We've, we're really proud of this project, every single one of us, and we're really excited to be able to bring it to the community. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday night. Uh, if you were here for the annual meeting as well as the talk, if you're watching via Facebook, thank you all so much for spending your Tuesday night with us. Uh, with that, we are now on our summer break. Uh, so please enjoy this warm spring summer weather while we have it. And we will see you all again on September 21st when we are welcoming Nicole Adams from the Oshawa Public Library for a talk on Oshawa's guiding history. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Please continue to stay safe. And uh, we're looking forward to once we can see you all in person. Have a lovely evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night.